welcome back. And today we're working on the UE1. This is a one bit vacuum tube computer that we're building from the ground up. And today specifically we're working on the memory, but the UE1 is a pretty strange little system and it really only has two bytes of memory. Uh, one byte is used for the scratch register, which is uh, right here. And uh, the other byte is used for an output register. And there's actually a subtle difference between the two that's gonna change how we build them out. And so that's what we're gonna dive into today. But before we get too deep into that, I wanna take a moment to address something. 2023 has been an insane year. I have had more fun in here working on these machines than just about any other time in my life. This has been an absolutely amazing and stunning journey and I am just gobsmacked that I am able to do this. And honestly, I wouldn't be able to do it if it weren't for the help of all the names scrolling by. So I wanna take a second to address my patrons directly. Thank you all so much for your support. I will never paywall anything. But in spite of knowing that, you guys have gone, gone above and beyond and decided to support me directly. And I, can't tell you how much that means to me. It means the absolute world. Like I said, nothing in here would be possible without your direct help. So thank you all so much. Uh, but if you are not a patron, I want to be very clear that I'm not trying to guilt you into becoming a patron. I understand that uh, financially that's not viable for a lot of people, or maybe that's just not something that you want to do. And that's totally okay. Uh, but all I ask is that you hop in the comments and give a shout out to all of the patrons that have supported this and made this possible. I don't know what I can do to ever repay them, but I think having the comment section filled up with just tons of you go patrons and thank you guys so much would be pretty awesome. Uh, so patrons, thank you so much, but also thank you to everybody that watches these videos. I'm going to keep making videos for as long as I can because we have got some insane projects like the Bendix and the Centurion and the PDP-11 and the UE-1 and UE-2, which we are currently working on developing. But we got to finish UE-1 first, and in order to do that, we have to build up the output register. So that is what we're going to dive into today. Let's hop over to the bench and get started. If you're not intimately familiar with the UE1, when you heard one bit computer and two bytes of memory, that probably sent off a couple of red flags that said, what on earth is this dude with big hair talking about? Uh, that does sound crazy, I'll admit, but the UE1 is my goal to try and build the most minimal computer possible. I did come across a very interesting little chip called the Motorola MC14500 or 14500 or 145 double aught or I don't know, however you want to pronounce it. Essentially, Motorola built this microprocessor back in the 70s. It has a really fascinating architecture. It has a proper logic unit, an accumulating result register, a one bit data bus, and all sorts of other really interesting things to gate that properly but it's not a bit slice processor, meaning you can't stack multiple of them up in parallel to get essentially an 8-bit computer. So that's what the UE1 is. We essentially built the MC14500 out of vacuum tubes, but we did make a couple of modifications. We added in a proper arithmetic logic unit and a uh, carry register. So it can do addition and subtraction now, but the uh, MC14500 is kind of incomplete. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have any uh, program control or any of that built into it. The user was expected to provide all of that. So for us, what we decided to do was build a uh, copy of uh, the minimal ICU system that Motorola outlines in their ICU handbook. And we've actually built exactly this before out of uh, integrated circuits. That's what this board is right here. I've got a full video on building this out and playing a game on it. So if you're interested in this one, check out the link in the description below. So we're building this and it's a pretty simple design. There's uh, two four bit counters at the top that give a 16 bit address that go into an EEPROM. The EEPROM provides eight bits of data out 
Four of those bits, 05 through 08, are used for the instructions for the processor. The other four bits are used for addressing to control the memory. The three bytes that we have is that we have uh, system inputs, so we've got eight bits for that. We have a scratch uh, register, so we've got eight bits for that, and we have system outputs. Now the scratch register is proper read-write memory, but system inputs is read-only memory, and system outputs is write-only memory. That's <laughs> That's right, we are using write-only memory on this machine. I think that is hilarious and awesome. Uh, but we've already built the system inputs. We have that set up there as a bunch of toggle switches that the user can flip. And we've already built the scratch register. That's those two long PCBs on the bottom that are already mounted. And all that's left to build is the uh, system outputs. But because we have the ability to do a parallel read of all eight bits, we need to change up how we build it compared to the scratch register next to it. So in order to understand that, let's take a look at how we built that scratch register. And this is the logic diagram for that. At its core, it's just a four NOR gate D flip-flop. A D flip-flop is what's called a data flip-flop. I think that's what the D stands for. Uh, but essentially you have a clock pin and you have a data pin. And whenever the clock hits, whatever is on the data pin is stored into the flip-flop and saved there. Now there is a problem with this in that we really only want to select one of these at a time. And that's what the OR gate and the big NOR gate on the far right are for. For the OR gate, the three inputs into this OR gate all have to go low in order for the clock to actually store whatever value is on the data bus. So we have an X select and a Y select, and these are going to be normally high, but whenever we set the address to the correct value, both of these will go low. Now, if we wanna to write to it, we take the inverse of the right pin. And so whenever the right pin goes high, the inverse goes low, our clock goes low and we store whatever is on that data pin. Now, if we want to read what we just stored, we've got this big four input NOR gate on the other side. We're actually taking the inverse output of the D flip-flop and running it into this NOR gate. And on top of that, we're taking the uh, non-inverted write pin and the X select and Y select. And again, all of these have to be low in order for the NOR gate to go high. So that is how we're using the scratch register. But we actually built it a little funky because, uh, well, space is at a premium. So we used this design here. This schematic is essentially exactly what we were just looking at. A NOR gate is just an OR gate that has an inverter attached to it. So we're using a bunch of diode logic to create a bunch of OR gates, and then we're using the vacuum tubes as inverters to turn those into NOR gates. However, there is one vacuum tube in the middle here that looks a little strange, and that's this one that's called 6977. This is not a traditional vacuum tube. Uh, it's actually a vacuum fluorescent display. These are not meant to be doing logic operations. They're just meant to be displays. But the uh, nature of how a VFD is constructed means that it works a lot like a triode. So I've created a sort of imbalanced SR flip-flop with a 6977 and a 6AU6 being the two parts of that flip-flop. And I think that's a really crazy but cool design, and it seems to work pretty well on the scratch bits. But the output register needs a little bit of a different requirement. So let's take a look at the uh, uh, logic diagram for it, which is right here. At its core, it looks exactly the same. We have those same four NOR gates creating a D flip-flop right in the middle. And we also have the three input OR gate acting as the inverse logic clock over on the left. Where things get interesting is on the right. Because we need to do a parallel read of all eight bits that are in the output register, we need to be able to read what's stored in the D flip-flop at any given moment. And so what we're doing here looks really simple. We're just pulling off of the inverse output, buffering it, and sending it out. But 
Well, that doesn't make sense. When the D flip-flop is storing a one, we're gonna get a zero out of here. And when the D flip-flop is storing a zero, we're gonna get a one out of here. That's backwards from what we need it to be. But if you look in the center, things look a little funky. The wiring has actually been changed. The output from the uh, top left NOR gate here now goes down to the bottom right NOR gate, and the bottom left NOR gate output goes to the top right NOR gate. We've actually flipped those around. And what that means is that uh, the uh, output and inverse output of the D flip-flop are now in different places. But why did I decide to draw it this way? Well, this goes back to that 6977 that I thought was so cool. It's actually biting us in the butt right now. So if we look at the plate resistors, we can kind of get an idea of where the problem lies. The 6AU6s use 33 kilo ohm resistors, but the 6977 uses a 100 kilo ohm resistor. Now this is three times larger, which means that we're going to have a whole lot less current coming out of this. The unfortunate side effect of this is that our non-inverted output, the output that we need to take and buffer and send on out into the world, is coming off of the 6977. That won't do. That'll just break our SR flip-flop and the whole thing will cease to work. So we need to pull the output off of the 6AU6. This is what we did in this one. So uh, that's why we had to do the weird wiring right here to flip which NOR gate is acting as the output and which one is acting as the inverted output. Uh, and so then all we do is we take that new output that's coming off of our 6AU6, we run it into a cathode follower buffer, and we send it out into the world as a system output that can be used for whatever we want. Ultimately, the goal is to maybe uh, plug these into a teletype and bitbang hello world or something. That would be pretty cool. Uh, but, well... You guys have seen me flail around with a bunch of different schematics and logic diagrams for long enough. I think it's time we actually build this up. And we'll be able to fit four bits on one board, so I'm going to have to cut two boards up. And I have a new design that I'm pretty happy with, and I've actually uh, had the mill running to cut it out. And five hours later, this PCB is the result. And I think it cut really well, with the exception of the traces over here on the far right. These are supposed to be one millimeter traces, and they are very much so not that. They are way skinnier. Because I use a V-bit whenever I mill my PCBs, if the PCB isn't exactly level, if one side sits a little higher than the other, the side that sits higher means that that V-bit is going to cut deeper and wider. So you can see very clearly that uh, this PCB was not completely flat when it was cut. I don't think this is a deal breaker. The traces are pretty thin, but thin traces can still carry a decent amount of current more than the uh, simple cathode followers can provide. Uh, so as long as there's a good connection there, I think we're totally in the clear. But talking with a good friend of mine, MX Shift, over on the Discord, uh, he mentioned something that I hadn't thought about. I am milling these by taping them down to a giant piece of wood, so I should probably be running a spring pass whenever I level that wood. And I hadn't been doing that up to now. Uh, so on the next one that I have to cut, I'll give that a shot. Maybe it'll uh, help keep these perfectly level. But I mean, the fact that it was already level within probably about 0.2 uh, or 0.3 of a millimeter is pretty impressive. And I think this PCB is gonna work excellent. Well, I hope it does. There could be a fatal design mistake on here, but there's only one way to find out and that is to solder it up. So I'm gonna crack open the laptop and hop on a live chat with my good friends over on the Discord and uh, use them to keep me entertained while I spend the next four to five hours soldering this thing up. And uh, I'll come back and show you guys what the finished result looks like. And here is the finished result. It looks absolutely stunning. I just love these really long PCBs with just huge amounts of vacuum tubes on them. It is 100% the aesthetic that I am aiming for. And man, I just love the way this turned out. Uh, but uh, I, <laughs> I actually have no idea if this works or not. So let's pull out the power supply, pull out a breadboard with some toggle switches on it and give this a test. All right, I think I've got my little test breadboard here hooked up correctly. It's essentially just a couple of toggle switches and a push button, and they're pulled high with uh, 4.7K ohm resistors. And then uh, if I turn the 
push button on, it pulls that input low. So right now I've got all four inputs high, I've got the data low, and uh, well, <laughs> I don't actually know if this will work. So let's flip the power switch and see what happens. Nothing. No voltage anywhere. All right, I tried to power it up and not a single filament came on. And that's not good. That tells me that I've got a fundamental design fault. And I think I've found it. Uh, and the problem lies in this final tube here on each of the collection of four. Uh, I'm running the filaments in series. So 24 volts comes into this tube, then uh, goes over to this one, then all the way over to this one, and finally to this one on the end. And then when it comes out of this filament, it needs to go to ground. And that's what we had set up here. There's a collection of traces. You can see pin seven, pin two, and pin three are all tied together. And uh, on the scratch register, this final fourth tube was an inverter. It was a four input NOR gate. So the cathode was tied directly to ground. But this is now a cathode follower buffer and the cathode on a cathode follower buffer is not tied to ground. It's the actual output. There's a uh, 220k ohm resistor between the cathode and ground. So tying the filament to that means that the filaments are never going to ground. That is an issue. That's a massive routing mistake. So I need to go through and cut these traces and then create a bodge that jumps over to the ground line, which is right next to it. I just forgot to do that change in the design. Uh, that's not going to be too much of an issue for this board that I haven't soldered up yet. I can get to the traces pretty easily, but on this one that's been soldered up, that might prove to be a bit of a challenge. All right, I think I've got everything hooked up correctly now. Uh, it was a pretty easy fix. The little one millimeter Harwin pin headers that I use for the uh, tube sockets here made that really easy to actually handle. Uh, it should work now. I've got the lights off, so hopefully I can see the filaments a little better. So we'll flip the power switch on here. Hopefully nothing goes up in smoke. I did see the current meter jump up. I can see some filaments coming alive. <laughs> That's excellent news. I can actually see some of the VFDs are on. They're not very bright. That's to be expected. All right, check this out. I've got all four bits selected, so all four should change simultaneously. I think you guys can see all, just barely all four of the VFDs on here. Uh, so check this out. There we go. They all turned off except for one. And they all turned back on again, except for one. That one was constantly on. Uh, so we actually are mostly functioning. We have one bit that is misbehaving, but troubleshooting one bit is a lot easier than troubleshooting four bits. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna try and figure out what's going on with this. And um, then I think we can declare this thing as fully working. That's, that's crazy. All right, there we go. It turns out that we just had uh, one tube that was not working correctly. This tube here came out of this slot that's right next to the VFD, which means that this is the tube that was paired with the VFD to create the mismatched uh, SR flip-flop. That doesn't mean that this tube is bad. It just means that its characters were not very well matched to the VFD. So we'll have to actually test this one later. It may still be good and be usable in other locations. Uh, but if we give this a bit of a test right now we can see there it goes kicks off kicks on storing a one storing a zero that is that's awesome how cool is that and i just realized that i've been referring to everything backwards i've been saying that when the vfd is illuminated the flip-flop is storing a zero and when the vfd is off the flip-flop is storing a one and that is true for the scratch register but for the output register that we've built here because we've changed the uh, inputs going into the SR flip-flop portion of our D flip-flop, it's actually back to what we would think is normal now. When the VFD is on, it's storing a one. When the VFD is off, it's storing a zero. So I actually confirmed that with the uh, multimeter here. We've got our parallel output on the four pins on the bottom here. So right now I've got a uh, zero, one, zero, one stored into it. So this lowermost bit should be a one. And we can see that is 18 volts. That's a little lower than I was hoping. I was hoping to see something over 20 volts, but uh, you know, that's to be expected. The flip-flop is not the best flip-flop and we're not doing a signal restoration stage. We're just taking that and buffering it and spitting it out. So that should be plenty for whatever external peripherals we're gonna set up, but that's 18 volts. The next bit should be off, which is three volts, that is good. The bit after that should be on, there's 18 volts. And then the final bit should be off, 
three volts. That is working a hundred percent perfectly. That is awesome. We now have our output register built. Well, half of it. I still got to build one more, which is this blank PCB right here. That's probably going to take another five hours to solder up. So that either way, that's awesome. That means that the design is working. That's excellent news. There we go. All bolted up and Oh man, what a difference adding 40 vacuum tubes to this board makes. It's really starting to look complete. Uh, this board needs to do four things. It needs to have the inputs, the scratch register, the output register, and program control on it. And now we have three of those four things bolted onto it. We've got our inputs up here at the top, we've got our scratch register here, and we've got our output register here. We are missing some important pieces though, and that's the pieces that connect all of that junk together. And those pieces are gonna run right along the side here and along the side this way as well. The only thing left then is program control, which is gonna be a paper tape that lives kind of in this area right here in the middle. And I'm still not entirely sure how we're gonna build that paper tape. There's a couple of unknowns about this system that uh, we have to figure out first before we can build the paper tape. So after we get all of the connection PCBs going on, we need to connect this board to this board, and then I need to build a remote control that plugs in right here at these uh, eight inputs that allows me to essentially single step through commands. So I can make sure that that board plays nicely with this board. And if that's the case, then we can start uh, putting a clock into it and running it at some form of speed. But again, we don't know how fast this thing is going to be capable of. I have zero clue what kind of speed we can achieve out of this. My personal hope is anything above 10 hertz. Really slow, but if we can do that, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I, the stretch goal is 45 hertz, because if we can run at 45 hertz, we can bit bang a teletype. But who knows, maybe this thing will run at 100 hertz or 150 hertz. I have no idea. So we need to build something to test the speed limit of the machine. Fortunately, it's just eight bits of a parallel input. So we can uh, emulate that pretty easily with an Arduino and some level shifters or something like that. It'll just be a temporary solution to really explore the limits of the machine. So that way, when we start building the paper tape, we know how to build the paper tape. So there's a lot more to come on the UE1. I uh, want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you're enjoying the journey of bringing this thing to life. So uh, thank you all so much, and I hope to see you in the next episode.